Welcome everyone. Um, uh, thank you for joining us in our Bunkey Clinic series of virtual, virtual visiting professors. Um, this morning, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Peter Nelligan. Dr. Nelligan really needs no introduction, but I'm just gonna go very briefly uh, before we begin his talk. Um, he was, as we know, formerly the chair of plastic surgery at the University of Toronto, uh, which he became in 1996. And in 1999, he became the Wharton Chair in Reconstructive Plastic Surgery. Um, he then moved to Seattle in 2007, where he was the director of the um, Center for Reconstructive Surgery at University of Washington. He's authored uh, 12 books, uh, 85 book chapters, over 200 peer-reviewed papers, um, and he's done over 300 visiting professorships, and he's a past editor-in-chief of JRM. Um, as you also know, he is the uh, editor-in-chief of the um, six-volume uh, textbook of plastic surgery, which is basically the standard reading, if you will, for all plastic surgeons and, and residents and trainees. Um, he's a past president of, of the uh, of PSF. He's a past president of ASRM. Um, he's the past president of the Skull Base Society. Um, he's also a past trustee of the ASPS uh, and a past board member of the Head and Neck Society as well. Uh, with that, Peter, thank you so much again for being with us. It's really an honor to have you. Um, and I'm going to make you the presenter now. Okay. So I see two logons from you. I'm just going to do the active one. Hopefully that's the one. And uh, you should see a prompt that you've been made the new presenter. And then you should be able to sh uh, press the button to share your screen. Perfect. We can see it. Okay, good. Fantastic. Good. First of all, thank you so much for the uh, the invite to to do this. Um, you know, the Bunky Clinic is 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 a is a famous place, and it's been uh, at the forefront of uh, of microsurgery for for 50 years. It's amazing. And and before I start, I just wanted to share my my personal story of um, of Harry Bunky. Um, when I was a fellow um, in the uh, in the uh, in the 80s, um, I went to a meeting of the International Microsurgery Society. It's one. Of the, it's a precursor of WRM, and it was in Nara, Japan. And um, I was. Uh, I arrived late. I got up the next morning. The morning of the meeting, went down to the dining room for breakfast. And um, Bruce Williams, who was the, the chief, the chair of plastic surgery in Montreal, um, was sitting with um, with God Almighty, with Harry Bunky, and I was kind of awestruck. And uh, as I walked into the dining room, um, Bruce Williams said, "Hey, Peter, come and join us." He, he knew me from from you know my Canadian Canadian Society, my my you know fellowship in Canada. So I sat down uh, with the two of them, and then um, after breakfast, um, Dr. Bunky and I walked to the meeting. The meeting was uh, across a park in uh, Nara, Japan, about a ten-minute walk. And and uh, during the two or three days of the meeting, we walked to the meeting every morning together. And, and got to know each other. And then we were coming back um, in the same flight from Japan. And of course, I was in the back of the plane, he was in the front of the plane. And uh, he, used to, he called me the Irishman. So uh, about three or four times during the flight, he came back from the front of the plane with a glass of whiskey for me. And he just said, here, Irishman, have this. He was an amazing guy. And uh, like, I was a nobody at the time, and he was, he was Harry Bunky. So I will never forget that, it's just amazing. All right, so um, my only disclosures are, are book royalties. Um, so when we talk about perforator flaps, you know, when we started, um, we had random flaps, and then we got axial flaps, and then my cutaneous flaps came along, and then perforator flaps. And perforator flaps really just uh, represent the next echelon of anatomic understanding. And um, the advantages of perforator flaps are that they give you precision in terms of donor tissue selection. So sometimes, um, you know, if I see a patient with a, a, a defect that I'm going to have to reconstruct, I'll sometimes give them the option of where they would like their donor scar. Um, and I might choose my flap based on that. Not always, obviously. But it also gives you increased versatility in the reconstructive choice. So you can, you can um, choose the tissue you want. You can be very specific in the, in the, uh, the elements of the flap that you take with you. Um, you get longer pedicle length, uh, which is a big advantage, whether it's a free flap or a, a, a pedicle flap. Uh, this, for example, is an example. This is a DIP flap that was being used for head and neck reconstruction. 
And you can see here the, the, the clips. So these clips are the muscular branches. So you can imagine the, mu the muscle would have been here uh, and you would have had a much shorter pedicle length uh, if this was a myocutaneous flap. You can see the, the, the length of uh, pedicle that you get when you take it as a perforator flap. The disadvantage of perforator flaps are that they require a detailed knowledge of the vascular anatomy. Um, the dissection can sometimes be tedious. Um, there's a potential for pedicle injury. Um, and, and some people are, are zealots and they think that, you know, if you're not doing perforator flaps, you, you shouldn't be operating. And I don't believe in that. I, I use all sorts of flaps. So the question then is, is where do uh, perforator flaps fit in our armamentarium? So I think they're in addition to our armamentarium, not really a replacement for existing flaps. Um, and perforators demand a particular technique of dissection. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, you, you find the perforator and you're very um, uh, particular about how you dissect that perforator. This is just a, a diagram representing the, the, the three main types of perforators that we find in the body. They're the direct perforators that come from the source vessel directly to the skin. The more common one we see is the muscle perforator that goes through a muscle and supplies the overlying skin. And these would have been the old myocutaneous flaps that we can now take as perforator flaps. And then there are septal perforators that uh, pass up in the, in the um, fascial septa between, uh, between muscles. And uh, perforators are dissected out from the, within the muscle. And what that means is that the, the traditional alignment of flaps to the underlying muscle is no longer necessarily valid. When I first started learning to do flaps in the, in the 70s, um, we would design our flap um, with the skin paddle directly over the muscle. And in fact, we would stitch the, the skin paddle to the underlying muscles so that we wouldn't risk damaging the perforators. And now we're actually finding those perforators and dissecting them out from within the muscle. But it means that you can align your flap to the perforator, not necessarily to the underlying muscle. So there are certain things that you need. Um, the one thing that you need uh, is a Doppler. Uh, because that allows you to find your perforator. And then the other things that you can use are a great help. But they're not absolutely necessary in order to do these flaps. And those are uh, CT angiograms. I actually do CT angiograms a lot, particularly if I'm doing a, a, a DIP flap. You've all seen pictures like this, where you see the uh, perforator coming up, coming up through the rectus muscle from the underlying um, deep inferior epigastric, or a, a picture like this, where you see this nice perforator coming up to the uh, uh, the fat of the abdomen. Uh, and what CT does for you is that it, it gives you good information about the position of perforators. It gives you good information about the course of the perforators. It gives you some information about uh, caliber, uh, but it doesn't give you any information about perfusion capacity. So you can see a perforator, but you don't know how much tissue that perforator is going to perfuse. What helps you with that is in designing green, because now you can uh, see in real time the perfusion of, um, of tissue. And this has changed the way I, I do um, some flaps. So if, I, if I'm designing a flap with multiple perforators, um, I'll choose the perforator that I think I want to use and I'll put a little clamp on the other ones and then I'll inject my um, I, ICG. Uh, this happens to be a, a DIP flap. Um, and if the perforator that I've chosen is perfusing all of the flap, um, and you can see here the, the perfusion lighting up, then I will just take that perforator. But about 10% of the time, I end up having to take another perforator. And uh, this is an example of that. This is an ALT flap that we're uh, raising, and it has two perforators. And um, this is a, a superficial dissection of the ALT. You can see one of the perforators right there, and uh, there's another perforator more distally. You can see it right there, and I'm dividing the fascia between the two. Now, if I can just take it on the proximal perforator, my dissection is going to be a lot quicker and easier. And so I put a clamp on the distal perforator, inject my ICG. And this is what you see. There is no perfusion of this distal tip. You can see the clamp on the perforator right here. And my resident is on the right-hand side. You'll see him in a minute turning around and taking that clamp off. Um, and um, this is telling me that the perforator I've chosen isn't sufficient to perfuse the whole flap. Now he's taking the, the clamp off the distal perforator, and now you can see the whole flap perfusing really nicely. Um, 
and that tells me that I need to take that. The new kid on the block is um, thermography, um, and uh, thermal cameras are very expensive. With this particular camera, you can buy at the Apple store for about 250 bucks, and it's an um, iPhone, it's called the Thermal One. And um, what I do is I'll. Uh, I'm going to ask the viewers to please keep your microphones off during the talk. Thank you. Um, what I'll do is I'll put a, a, a green towel soaked in uh, um, ice water uh, on the, the body part, let's say the abdomen, for example, while, um, uh, while everybody's is fussing around putting clothes in and lines in. And then I'll uh, take the, the, um, the, the cold towel off the, the part about you know, 10, 15 minutes later and get my camera out. And this is what you see. So this is a DIP flap. And here you see two perforators start to light up and they're connected. There's no gap between them. And over here, there's another perforator and you start to see a perfusion going between the two. And these are choke vessels that are opening up. So thermography gives you really good information on, uh, on not only the position of your perforators, but also whether they're direct, directly connecting perforators or whether they're choke vessels. Uh, and it's a really useful and very cheap way of figuring out what uh, what you need to do. So what do you need to know? So you need to know uh, anatomy and specifically you need to know perforator pattern and there are different uh, patterns of perforators. So uh, there are basically four different types. There are perforators with a short intramuscular course, uh, perforators with a long intramuscular course, um, perforators with a subfascial segment and uh, paramuscular perforators. Um, and in the abdomen, there is another type of perforator that you come across, which is the uh, perforator um, at the tendinous inscription. And knowing this just gives you um, a forewarning of how easy or difficult it's going to be to dissect your pedicle. It may also um, allow you to choose a pedicle that's going to be an easier dissection than uh, one that with a more difficult dissection. And this is just a diagrammatic representation of that. So the easiest one is, is the direct perforator, where you've got the perforator going right through the muscle to the skin. It's usually an easy dissection. You get down to the, to the source vessel and continue your dissection, and it's easy. The perforator with a long intramuscular course is more difficult because you have multiple uh, muscle perforators that you have to control. So the dissection is more tedious. Um, this is the one that's important to recognize. Sometimes you'll get a perforator that goes straight up through the muscle, and then it runs on the muscle, but under the fascia. And when you open the fascia in order to dissect out the pedicle, if you're not aware of that, you can easily damage that perforator. So it's, it's good to always keep that in mind. Um, the, the easiest one of all, of course, is the paramuscular perforator. You'll see that sometimes in the, in the abdomen of the rectus muscle where the perforator comes up on the medial side of rectus. You also see it uh, very commonly in the TDAP flap where the perforator um, instead of going through the latissimus, goes around the lateral border of the latissimus. Um, and then the, the perforators at the tendinous intersection, those are a real pain because the dissection is very, very difficult because everything is stuck. Um, so it's good to know that knowledge ahead of time. And often you can get that knowledge from your uh, CT angio. So what I'm going to do now is, is start at the top and, and, and work down, uh, down the body. And it's, it's, not, it's impossible to cover every flap, but I'm just going to show you some flaps that I find useful. Um, uh, the first is the facial artery perforator flap. And um, this is a patient with um, melanoma excision. Um, and there are lots of different ways that you can close this defect. Um, what I'm showing you is not necessarily the, the right way or the only way, but it's one of the ways that you can do this. So if you get your Doppler out and you run it along the facial artery, you come across these crescendos of noise along the course of the uh, facial artery. And these uh, little crescendos represent perforators. And you can design a flap around those perforators, in this case, around that perforator next to the defect. And people say, well, how big a flap can you take? And, and the, the general answer is that you can take um, two, uh, the, the perfusion area of two perforosomes. And so in this case, uh, we're designing a flap based on that proximal perforator. Um, uh, near the defect, taking the tertiary of the next perforator with us. And the way you do these flaps is to make, uh, you make an incision medially right here, or, or it doesn't matter which side, but you make an exploratory incision first and have a look at the perforator to see if you're comfortable with it. And to be comfortable with a perforator like this, these things are really small. 
Um, but to be comfortable with it, I want to see it pulsating. If I don't see pulsation in the perforator, then I'm going to just do something else. Um, and that applies to really to all perforator, uh, pedicle perforator flaps that I use. And your Doppler is your friend because you find your perforator with your Doppler, you do your dissection, and then you rotate your flap uh, into the defect. In this case, we're doing it, it's a propeller flap, we're rotating at 180 degrees. And once you've done your rotation, you get your Doppler again and you listen uh, for your Doppler signal. If your Doppler signal is present, then you're fine. You can close and go home. Uh, if your Doppler signal is absent, then you need to do some more dissection. And the commonest mistake people make uh, with these um, uh, uh, perforator flaps, with these propeller flaps, is that they don't dissect the pedicle down to the source vessel. Um, and that's really important because then you get a, a gentle, um, instead of an acute twist on the vessel, you get a gentle twist, a gentle curve. This is one I did recently, another melanoma patient. Uh, you can see we've rotated the flap listening to the Doppler at the end of the procedure. Uh, and here he is post-operatively. Post this is just a, an example to show you the uh, anatomy. So this is a patient who um, had radiation as a teenager for acne, um, and then subsequently for the rest of her life has had multiple basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, she had a large squamous cell in her forehead here, and we put a, a big ugly flap intending to come back and do a nasal reconstruction. But while, while that was happening, she presented with this new lesion here in her lip. Um, and we designed a, a, a pedicle or, or a, a facial artery perforator flap. And when you do the dissection, you can see the two perforators right here. And you dissect it some more down to the source vessels. And this is a facial artery running into the superior lab labial artery with the two perforators coming off it. And uh, you just, uh, you can put a clamp on, in this case, you put a clamp on the facial artery uh, and look at the flap, make sure it's okay. You can also use ICG to make sure that you're perfusing nicely. And in this case, we just divided the facial artery and rotated the flap uh, into the defect. So it's, it's a really useful flap um, uh, for, for, for certain indications. Another really useful flap is a submental flap. This is the patient with a morpheiform basal cell on the upper lip. Uh, and this is her excision. You can see we've closed part of the excision by advancement here. And we've got a, a submental flap ready to bring up. And here's the submental flap. Uh, there's the pedicle, and it's simply tunneled up into the defect. Um, and this is the anatomy. Um, so this is the, um, the anterior belly of the digastric that's just been uh, divided and reflected in this drawing just to show the anatomy. There are two, uh, usually two perforators that run up uh, on either side or sometimes through the anterior belly of the digastric. And I usually take the anterior belly of the digastric with me when I'm doing this flap. The most important thing uh, is this. So the submental artery is a branch of the facial artery. It has been a comitantes with it. But there's also another vein um, coming from the anterior facial vein uh, that's adjacent to but not intimately connected with the um, submental artery. It's, impos it's important to take this vein. So I like to start my, um, my flap by identifying this anatomy first, if I'm making sure that I have those two structures, the submental artery and this uh, um, submental vein in my, uh, in my flap. Um, and uh, there's the submental artery and there's the vein. Uh, and this is what the flap looks, af uh, looks like afterwards. Uh, these flaps always look a bit kind of purplish or uh, beat up um, when, you, when you tunnel them up. But ultimately, uh, they look wonderful. And the color match and the texture match is really great. Um, and the nicest thing about them is the donor scar. The donor scar is under the chin. The patient can't see it. And in elderly patients, particularly, um, you get a little bit of neck tightening, which patients love. Um, and you can also use it in young patients. This is just to show you what happens if you don't take that uh, extra vein. So this is a patient with uh, a spitzoid venous syndrome. You can see she's had a previous forehead flap. Uh, and she now presents with disease in her upper lip and, and requires this excision. Um, and this was her submental flap after we uh, transferred it, not looking very happy. Uh, fortunately, we were able to, to leach it uh, and bring it back to life. Uh, but the reason that happened was that uh, I failed to take that uh, extra vein and just took it on the submental artery itself. Uh, and this is what that patient looks like now. Uh, this is the patient who came with a, a, a squamous cell carcinoma uh, on, her, um, on her cheek, as you can see. 
and we were planning to do a facial artery perforator and it was summertime and she was wearing her coat. She was with her daughter with whom she lived. Um, and um, her daughter said, mom, take your coat off. And, and she very reluctantly took her coat off. And when she did, we found this on her shoulder. Uh, it's a, a sessile squamous cell carcinoma that she had hidden from her, from her daughter. And uh, this is her defect. And one of my favorite flaps for this uh, particular defect is, uh, is this flap. This is a parascapular flap. This is the circumflex scapular artery. And um, the flank is a very forgiving area for closure. So you can take uh, quite a large flap and close the defect uh, primarily. And in this case, uh, this is uh, uh, propellered up into the shoulder. Um, the circumflex scapular artery um, gives a branch to the lateral border of the scapula. Um, and in this particular case, because we wanted a nice long uh, pedicle with a gentle curve on it, I just divided the um, branches to the lateral border of the scapula, and that brings you right down to the axilla. So you've got a very long pedicle, and you can very easily and safely rotate that uh, into the shoulder uh, to close the defect. And as you can see, the secondary defect is closed. Uh, very easily and very nicely. Moving around to the front, this is a patient uh, with uh, who's had a pharyngoesophagectomy. This is an ALT flap used to reconstruct his uh, his uh, uh, pharynx. Uh, there's the pedicle, but he also has this anterior um, skin defect on his neck. And um, the the obvious way to close this would be with a with a pec major flap, and that works fine. Uh, the problem is that sometimes the pec major can be bulky, and sometimes that bulk may impinge on this tracheostome. And this is a, a permanent tracheostomy, so you don't want bulk around it, or you may have to go back and revise it. The, the more traditional way to close this defect would be with the delta pectoral flap. Uh, the delta pectoral flap is based on the, the first four intercostal uh, internal mammary perforators. Uh, but in order to take uh, the flap over the deltoid region, you have to delay the flap. And you're left with a donor site that's very unsightly that has to be skin grafted. And furthermore, uh, when, you, when you rotate that flap, you have a dog ear exactly where you don't want it, uh, right on the tracheostome. So uh, we had planned to do a, a, a pec major on this, as you can see, but we got the, got the Doppler route and we found this is the thoracochromial artery, which is much more lateral than, than you expect in a pec flap. Um, but here you've got really nice uh, internal mammary perforators. And what we did in this case, was to take the segment of costal cartilage between those two perforators out, brought us right down to the internal mammary, and then divided the internal mammary distal to the runoff of those two perforators, and then simply tunneled that flap uh, into the neck. So you get the same skin territory as pec major without the bulk. Um, the defect can be closed directly, and you've got a nice, uh, a nice flap uh, to cover your defect. This is the IMAP flap. So the IMAP flap is a very useful flap for defects like this, but also for little defects. Um, this is another patient with a, um, who had a, a T4 squamous cell carcinoma of the mandible. This is actually a plate that you're seeing here. So he's got exposed plate. He's had bilateral neck dissections and radiation, and he's got uh, chronic radiation ulcers in his neck. So this is a, a, a difficult neck to reconstruct. We need to... Um, reposition his lower lip and cover his plate, which we've done here. Um, and that neck is like, is like cement. So you don't want to do any dissection within that neck. And so what we did for him was to close the neck with bilateral uh, IMAP flaps. And you can see the, the um, pedicle is really quite robust. The, the largest of these pedicles is the second internal mammary, uh, the perforated from, in the second intercostal space from the internal mammary. Um, but you can take a flap on any of these perforators. Uh, and this was simply rotated up into the defect. Uh, the secondary defect was closed directly, uh, gave him a funky looking chest, but nevertheless, one that, uh, that worked, worked quite well. Here he is post-op. This is um, uh, another patient, just to show you uh, other applications of the IMAP. So this is uh, a patient with a large basal cell carcinoma in the chest. Um, and um, this, is, this is his neck here. This is the defect. You can see we've doctored out the uh, internal mammary perforator. Um, and we've actually got two perforators. And like I told you before, I've, I've clamped one of them to make sure that the flap is OK on the, on the perforator that I want to take. Um, and it is. Uh, and so here we've got the, 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 the perforator dissected out. We've divided that distal perforator. And now we just rotate it in, uh, listen with our doctor, make sure our signal is OK. Uh, and then we just close the defect. 
So it's a very, very uh, useful flap. Uh, this is another patient that I did just recently. This is a patient with um, uh, metastatic breast cancer, and she had um, a vascular stent right here that was exposed. And they asked me to if I could close it. Um, and I asked them, you know, can you take the stent out, put a new one in, and, and you know, we'll close it more securely. And um, they said no, because that stent was a, um, an extra anatomic stent that came from the right atrium to the uh, left arm. Um, this patient had bulky metastatic disease in her arm and had blocked off her venous drainage oh, from her. And so what we did was um, a, a, a internal mammary, small internal mammary perforator. She also had impending exposure of a port uh, for her chemo. Um, and here we've done uh, an IMAP flap uh, right here. This is a, um, uh, a um, supraclavicular flap that we've done. And I've advanced the IMAP flap, de-epithelialized part of it, and wrapped it around that stent, and then used this um, supraclavicular flap as a V to Y advancement. And over here, we've got another uh, IMAP flap that we're going to just rotate up to cover her impending uh, port exposure. You can see the port right here. Um, so I, I map B to Y and a superclavicular B to Y and a second superclavicular. And there you can see the pedicle of, the, of that second I map. And there's her port. And here she is uh, postoperatively uh, with her, her flap sealed. Another useful flap is the um, dorsal scapular artery perforator flap. Um, you're probably all familiar with the uh, trapezius flap. And this is just really a... Um, a variation of that, where you're taking the flap on the dorsal scapular artery without taking the trapezius muscle. Uh, and again, the advantage of that is that um, uh, you don't uh, have the same amount of bulk, and particularly if you're mo moving it up to the head neck area, um, um, tunneling a trapezius flap is always really difficult, whereas uh, tunneling a flap like this is not, is not difficult. Uh, this is a patient with a recurrent uh, sarcoma in her neck, as you can see here. Um, requiring excision. Um, here's her excision. Uh, and this was closed with a uh, dorsal scapular perforator flap. Here's the flap um, uh, taken without taking trapezius muscle and then tunneled uh, into the neck um, where, it, where it works extremely well. Um, so it's a flap that I, that I love. Um, and uh, you can do it either as a, 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 an island flap or you can also do it as something like a V to Y. Uh, I did a V to Y last week for a patient with uh, metastatic supraclavicular disease and a supraclavicular defect. So it works really well for that. So Mustafa Hamdi um, uh, published uh, this paper um, in 2006 on the, the intercostal artery perforator flaps. And there are several uh, of these flaps and they're very useful to know. So there's the posterior intercostal perforator and there's a couple of lateral intercostal perforators and then there's the anterior intercostal perforator. Um, and um, the posterior intercostal perforator uh, is, these perforators are, are surprisingly large and robust. Uh, this is a 17-year-old with a dermatofibrosarcoma on her back. This is the midline of her back. Her neck is up here. And here's the flap uh, uh, marked out that the Doppler, uh, the perforator is Doppler and the flap is designed around it. And you can see the size of the uh, perforator is really quite large. And that's simply tunneled into the defect, um, and the secondary defect is closed, uh, which gives you a very nice um, uh, reconstruction in, in a, an otherwise uh, difficult area. I mean, there are other ways to close this, but this is a very neat way to do it. One of my favorites is the anterior intercostal perforator. This is a patient, again, with a sarcoma uh, between her breasts uh, and a relatively young woman. You don't want to distort her breasts uh, if you can avoid it. Um, and this is uh, the anterior intercostal. So this is her nipple here, as you can see, um, and this is the inframammary fold. So you make an incision in the inframammary fold, you doctor out your perforator, uh, make an incision in the inframammary fold, have a look at the perforator, make sure you're happy with it. Again, you want to see it pulsating. Then uh, if you're happy with it, you design your flap. Uh, and uh, this is that particular flap just advanced as a B2Y. And this advances um, amazingly. Um, and the donor defect is in the inframammary fold, as you can see here. And here is her uh, post-operative result. Um, this, is, uh, this is another patient that I did just recently, again, with the sarcoma uh, in between the breasts, um, uh, anterior intercostal flap um, advanced and closed. And here's her post-operative result. So it's, it's a great flap. And the donor site is, uh, is great as well. 
A lot of these flaps can be used for uh, chest wall or, or partial breast reconstruction. Uh, the lateral intercostal perforator is, is useful for closing um, defects of the lateral chest wall or the lateral breast. Uh, this is a patient with uh, um, a, a carcinoma of the breast, as you can see over here, requiring uh, a, a lumpectomy with a fairly significant um, a parenchymal excision, small skin excision. Um, and these two have been doctored out. This is uh, one of them is probably the lateral intercostal, the other one's probably the thoracodorsal. Again, you make an exploratory incision and look at your perforators and figure out if you're, if you're comfortable. This is the lateral intercostal flap, as you can see here. This is the um, intercostal nerve, intercostal artery, and this is simply tunneled into the defect in the breast. Uh, the, 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 the disadvantage of this particular flap is that the, the pedicle is not particularly long, so you, you can only reconstruct lateral chest wall defects or lateral breast defects. You can't go more medial than that. Um, but this is her uh, preoperatively and postoperatively. Uh, and you can see the uh, donor scar is, uh, is uh, easily hidden under clothing. So it's a very, very satisfactory flap. The other flap in that area is the thoracodorsal perforator. And uh, it's, it's a great flap. Uh, it can be used for, um, for chest wall. It can be used for, I've used it for upper arm uh, as a pedicle flap. Uh, this is a patient with, again, a, a more medial uh, lumpectomy um, and a fairly significant uh, parenchymal excision of the breast. Um, and this is the latissimus dorsi flap. Um, this pedicle goes through the latissimus. And as you split the latissimus, you go down to the main trunk of the, uh, of the pedicle. And the, the nerve is sitting right on the uh, pedicle at that stage. And, but it's very easy to uh, dissect it off the pedicle. And you can get quite a long length. You can dissect it all the way up to the axilla. Sometimes um, this perforator, uh, instead of going through the muscle, comes around the anterior border of the latissimus. And when you, when, you, uh, when you find that, that's a real gimme. It's a really easy dissection when you do that. Um, uh, there we go. Um, and this is it's not a good quality video, but I just wanted to show you how robust and how long this uh, pedicle is. So this is a thoracodorsal perforator being dissected out. Uh, and you'll see in a minute that it's a very, um, uh, robust, uh, long pedicle. There you can see it, and you can appreciate it pulsating very nicely. So it's one, It's a, a really useful uh, flap. This is that same patient uh, before and after uh, reconstruction with her uh, Tdap flap. And this is a patient uh, uh, of mine that I did, uh, uh, who had a sarcoma in his upper arm, and this is a pedicle Tdap flap to reconstruct that defect. You can see the donor scar right here. Um, this is uh, one of my patients who's probably the worst scar former I've ever come across. Uh, she was burnt um, with cooking oil as a, as a child in Vietnam. Um, and when I first saw her, she couldn't close her mouth. And uh, this is actually a free um, parascapular flap that I use for her neck contracture. Uh, and I had to go back subsequently and do another one. I excised all of this um, uh, skin graft and put an Integra and another graft on it, and it's scrunched up into a horrible scar again, and she started to contract, so I put another Tdap. But um, uh, she also had this contracture in her elbow, which we were able to fix with multiple Z-plasties, but she had a fairly significant contracture of her axilla right here, so we needed a flap for that. And this is the uh, scar of her parascapular flap that I'd used for her neck, and you can see um, I've marked, uh, this is where I found a, a Doppler signal and what we did was just open that scar so I could look at that uh, perforator. Uh, and I found that it was actually coming from the uh, serratus branch. It was a serratus perforator, nice, robust pedicle. And once I was happy with the perforator, then I went ahead and excised the contracture in her axilla, uh, designed the flap, uh, and uh, brought it up as, um, as a pedicle flap. And we were able to close that defect, um, uh, the secondary defect. And here she is at the end of that procedure. Um, this is her now. Uh, she's subsequently had multiple flaps. She looks terrible, but she's um, quite mobile and, and, uh, and happy. Um, actually, I since did on this area here where she contracted, I did a skip flap because I wanted a, a nice uh, thin flap. But this is her first parascapular. This is her second parascapular. This is her serratus perforator flap. And these are two um, dorsal scapular perforated flaps that I brought up for, uh, for her neck contraction. 
So I mentioned the skip flap. I used a skip flap on her more recently. But the skip flap is a very useful flap, either as a pedicle flap or a free flap. This is a young woman with uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva uh, requiring a radical vulvectomy. And the, the skip flap is a nice flap for this defect because it's nice and thin. Uh, the donor scar is wonderful because it's in the groin crease. Um, and here you see we've got one flap uh, ready. We're getting, uh, uh, we've marked out the second flap. And this can be dissected down to the source vessel and then uh, advanced uh, either as a V to Y or uh, rotated as a, um, as a propeller flap. In this case, we were able to do V to Y flap uh, from both sides. The back was closed just with the uh, rhomboid flaps. Uh, but it gives you very nice um, thin uh, tissue to, uh, to uh, uh, execute this reconstruction. This is another skip flap. This is a free skip flap and a patient, a young woman with a sarcoma on her chest wall. Um, uh, plugged into an internal mammary perforator. Um, and this is her donor defect. So you can see the donor scar is really, really nice. It's just in the, uh, in the uh, uh, groin crease. So the SCAP flap, um, we, we think of often as a, as a backup flap for breast reconstruction. And, and it's a, a, a perfectly good flap for that, but it's also good as a, uh, as a, a pedicle flap. Uh, this is a, another patient with sarcoma of the buttock, as you can see here. Um, this is his excision. Um, and this is right over his ischium. So you want something robust and bulky that he's, uh, that's going to cover the ischium because he's going to be sitting on this. Um, and uh, in this case, we just um, mobilized the superior gluteal. You can see it's a nice thick flap. Uh, and this was just uh, rotated down into the defect. You can see his gluteus is intact here, which is important in an ambulatory patient. Uh, and this is his immediate post-operative appearance, and this is his late post-operative appearance. So he's got a nice bulky flap uh, covering his ischium, which allows him to sit uh, safely. Moving on down, the uh, anterior lateral thigh flap, uh, you, you all uh, know and have used, I'm sure. Um, the, uh, the, the anatomy is that the sending back lateral cell gives both uh, septic cutaneous as well as Iocutaneous branches. About 85% of these uh, go through the muscles. Small percentage, about 50% are septic cutaneous. So when you see a septic cutaneous one, that's uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, the rectus femoris muscle right here. That's just lateralis, and here's the uh, the pedicle. Uh, and this flap can be taken with fascia, um, or if you don't need any fascia in your reconstruction, you can take it as a superfascial dissection. It's got a nice big pedicle, and um, this is um, uh, just the dissection of the superfascial dissection. When I'm doing a superfascial dissection, I start at the, uh, at the posterior incision, doctor out my, my perforators first, obviously, uh, and then uh, identify my, uh, my uh, pedicle going into the flap. And then just as the same as, as if I'm doing a DIAP, there's a perforator right there. I open up the fascia. Uh, and uh, and chase the, the the perforator down, as opposed to a subfascial dissection, where I'll usually start anterior, uh, go through the fascia, go down, find my descending branch. Uh, in this case, I do it in a retrograde fashion. But the um, the um, uh, superfascial dissection gives you a very nice uh, thin flap, uh, and you can actually dissect this. Uh, JP Hong in Korea uh, uh, takes this at the uh, level of scarpus, so it's even thinner. Um, in the male, usually the, the thigh is, is fairly thin. In the female, it's, it's uh, quite a bit thicker. Um, so um, you, you may need to go more superficially if you want a really, really thin flap. Um, this is a superfascial flap. Here I've got two perforators. You can see I've clamped one, and I do my usual trick with ICG to make sure that I'm okay to, taking the, the, uh, the flap on, on, on one pedicle. Um, but the other thing you can do when you go superfascial is you can, you can thin the flap. Um, uh, if you're if you're scared to take it at the superfascial level, then you can take it at the deep fascial level, and then you can uh, you can thin it out afterwards, leaving some uh, bulk around the uh, around the perforator. Um, and it's great as a, 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 a pedicle flap or a free flap. This is a patient with a metastatic carcinoma of the colon, requiring abdominal wall resection, um, and this is his flap. And in this case, we've taken a large amount of fascia. Uh, and we've taken the complete uh, lateral circumflex femoral uh, pedicle, both the 
descending branch supplying the ALT and the fascia and the transverse or superior branch supplying the TFL. Uh, and this is tunneled under, this is rectus femoris here. Uh, and, and when you're tunneling under the rectus femoris, uh, you need to be aware of the uh, blood supply of the rectus femoris. There are usually two perforators um, or two vessels supplying it. Uh, and you can safely divide one of them. Uh, but you don't want to devascularize the rectus femoris because if you do, uh, the patient may be left with um, a, a, a lag in the in knee extension if the rectus femoris uh, dies. Um, and in this particular case, we, we tunnel this up uh, to close the abdomen, a relatively small skin paddle, but a large fascial, um, uh, fascial element to the flap to reconstruct the abdominal wall. Uh, this is a, a, a more typical uh, application of ALT, a guy with the sarcoma in the groin, uh, again, uh, the flap is taken superfascially and, and uh, uh, tunneled under the rectus femoris. You can always recognize the rectus femoris by the white, dense white fascia on the undersurface of the uh, rectus femoris. Here you can see the pedicle going underneath it, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is closed. Um, this is a patient who had a squamous cell carcinoma of the penis uh, with bilateral uh, uh, inguinal nodes, bilateral inguinal node dissection, radiation, and subsequent exposure. And uh, the, the standard way to reconstruct these defects is with the, with the rectus femoris flap, which you can uh, simply uh, uh, turn over like a book uh, to uh, fill this defect and then skin graft it. And it works really well. But as I said, uh, one of the downsides with that is that you, unless you repair the extensor mechanism, you can leave the patient with some knee extensor lag. And this was a relatively young, uh, active man, so I didn't want to take both rectus femoris muscles. And so we took uh, bilateral uh, pedicle ALTs. Um, uh, again, you can see that deep fascia, the deep um, fascia under the rectus femoris muscle, nice big pedicle. Uh, and this was tunneled under the rectus. Uh, part of it was de-epithelialized to fill the dead space. The secondary defect was, uh, was closed directly, as you can see here. Um, and, and this is him postoperatively. So the ALT is a wonderful flap for all sorts of things. Um, this is a patient, again, you can see I do a lot of sarcoma uh, surgery. This is a patient with a scrotal layer my sarcoma. And um, when I, I got the call to come and close, and um, when I walked into the operating room, this was the specimen. Uh, and, and then I looked at the table, and this is what I saw uh, on the table. Um, and when you, when you, um, when you're looking at a, a big defect like this, you need to figure out what the elements are because probably one flap isn't going to, isn't going to close a defect like this. Uh, one of the main things is this, this big uh, retractor. Once you take it out, you realize that the, the abdominal wall is actually fine. You can close the abdomen. So it's a pelvic defect. And there's two elements to it. There's the pelvic floor and then there's the skin. So for the pelvic floor, what we did was a, um, a, a VRAM flap. This is a vertical rectus that's been de-epithelialized, folded on itself, uh, sutured to, the, uh, to itself and to the uh, pelvic uh, rim. And so that solves the pelvic uh, problem. And now you just have an external skin defect. And this is a pedicle ALT. And in this particular case, he had both urinary and bowel diversion. So we didn't have to worry about uh, any orifices coming through this, uh, this flap. But the um, uh, ALT for perineum is, is, a, is a really good flap. So um, when, when I was training, we were taught that um, for the proximal uh, lower leg, you could reconstruct with a gastric flap. The, the middle lower leg, you could use soleus, but the distal lower leg, you ha had to use a free flap. Um, and, um, and that's not necessarily true. This is a, an elderly patient with um, a sarcoma of the uh, lower leg. Uh, this is her ankle uh, down here, as you can see. And this is a um, uh, posterior tibial uh, perforator flap, uh, which is propeller down. And, and this is just um, uh, to show you the pedicle. It's a nice robust pedicle, which you must dissect down to the source vessel. And this is just a video to show you how much mobility you get with this flap. Um, so you can see where her, uh, you can see the, the glove on her foot down there. So we're right down at the ankle and you can easily get that flap down to cover any defect that you want down there. Uh, so it's a very useful flap. And this is just to show you how you dissect out these. So the, the, the pedicle, uh, you, you make the exploratory incision, look at the, the perforator, make sure you're happy with it. And then the, the, the section is very easy. This is a superficial dissection. Um, 
uh, staying on the deep fascia down to your perforator. And then once you get to your perforator, uh, just the same as if you're doing a DIP flap, you open up the fascia and dissect the perforator down to the thesaurus vessel. Um, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit, just in the interest of time. So here you can see the perforator, and uh, we're now opening the fascia. And you can see that perforator is, is a, a, a large, uh, pulsating, robust perforator, which is what, what you want to see. Um, and um, uh, just the same as, as any, any um, uh, perforator flap, you divide the various muscle branches, go all the way down to the source vessel, because this flap is going to be a uh, propeller 180 degrees. Um, and again, I'm going to speed it up here a little bit. We're just dissecting out the, the, the pedicle, going down to the posterior tibial itself. Uh, there's the, the uh, pedicle. You can see it's nice and big. And again, as I showed you before, you use your Doppler. You, you use your Doppler to find the perforator. You use it again at the end of your dissection. Make sure your Doppler signal is there. And then you rotate the flap into where you want it to go and listen again with your Doppler. Um, and if your Doppler signal is there, you, you're good to go. If your Doppler signal is not there, it means that either there's too acute a twist on the pe pedicle, or you may have uh, some soft tissue strangulating it. So you need to, to um, uh, do some more dissection. And as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the, the commonest mistakes that people make is not to dissect the perforator down to, uh, down to the source. And once you're happy with everything, you just rotate it into the defect, as you can see here. Uh, you can check your pedicle, and again, you get your Doppler out and check your check your Doppler signal to make sure you're okay. Uh, and then, um, sorry, this is um, uh, what are we doing here? Here we go. This is what it looks like afterwards. So these uh, propeller flaps for the lower extremity are are re really useful. Um, and this is the last case I'm going to show you. Um, the back is a is a, a difficult area to reconstruct, uh, particularly if you're considering doing a doing a free flap. Um, and this is a, a case that I that I did probably 15 or more years ago uh, of a patient with um, a sarcoma on her back um, that's previously been closed with two rhomboid flaps, as you can see. Uh, she's got uh, radiation changes, and she now has recurrent sarcoma here. And so what we did with her, um, you can see the egg crate. Um, mattress imprint on her back, because what we did was uh, harvested a DIAP flap, um, turned her on her on her front, and uh, ex did her excision. Here's her excision, and then plugged our flap in, which worked fine, but it was a, a, an all-day surgery, difficult surgery, because we had to turn her multiple times. Um, this is a, a patient with, um, this is actually squamous cell carcinoma of the back, but not dissimilar to the previous dissection, um, or the previous uh, patient. And, and this is closed with, with two uh, keystone flaps. Uh, so this is the dissection. These are the keystone flaps. And uh, the keystone flaps are simply advanced. The secondary defect is closed with a V to Y. So there's two V to Ys at the back of each flap. Uh, and this whole thing takes you know two hours to do this whole case, as opposed to all day to do the other cases I showed you. So the keystone flap uh, was described by uh, uh, Felix Bian, he's a, a, a plastic surgeon in Melbourne, and it's a wonderful flap for all sorts of applications. And it's it's called a keystone because of the shape is generally uh, like the shape of the keystone, architectural keystone uh, in, in an arch. Um, and it, this is the way it's designed. So if you have a defect like this, uh, you drop tangents from the defect. Um, and I usually make the, the flap uh, one to one and a half times the size of the defect. If I'm using bilateral flaps, then the flaps are a little smaller. Um, and uh, you do your dissection uh, through skin, uh, subcutaneous tissue, uh, um, and fascia. Um, so you just incise the skin and the underlying fascia all the way around the flap. You do very minimal undermining. The only part you undermine is uh, the leading edge for about a couple of centimeters. Otherwise, you don't do any undermining. You don't have to find perforators. Uh, these flaps are supplied by multiple perforators coming from the undermined muscle. So you only undermine the leading edge, and then you advance the flap. And when you do, uh, you're left with a defect uh, where the flap has been advanced from. And you just close that defect with, uh, with two V to Ys. And that brings the posterior wall uh, closer together so that you can close it. This is probably the largest uh, keystone flap I've ever done this patient, again, with the recurrent sarcoma. Uh, 
uh, closed with uh, with two uh, keystone flaps, um, and, uh, which was relatively simple to do in an otherwise really really difficult situation. Uh, this is a patient with uh, recurrent squamous cell carcinoma of the breast requiring uh, chest wall excision. Um, uh, again, closed with um, a, a keystone flap. You can see the amount of advancement that you get, uh, which is really quite remarkable. Um, and this is just a video clip to show you the amount of advancement you can get. This is a patient with exposed uh, hardware in his back, as you can see, uh, and the keystone flap has been, uh, has been uh, prepared. Again, cutting through skin and fascia, and you can see the amount of advancement. And if that amount of advancement is not enough, then you do another one from the other side. So you do bilaterals. Um, and you can use it anywhere. This is on the foot, a patient with a melanoma on the foot, um, and uh, it advances extremely nicely because this is a difficult area to reconstruct. Otherwise, you can see the blue dye is just from this, just the isosulfan blue from the central node biopsy. Um, uh, another defect just in front of the ankle closed with the, uh, with the keystone. So uh, to summarize, um, perforator flaps are really a, a great addition to our armamentarium. There are, there are multiple options that give us um, increased versatility um, at the reconstructive site, but also at the, uh, at the donor site. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, uh, Peter, thank you so much. This was really a masterclass um, of using perforators um, to basically um, the maximal extent all over the body from head to toe. So thank you so much for that. And I think I, I encourage all viewers to, um, if you're interested in perforator flap surgery or want to le learn more, to check out Dr. Nelligan's textbook on perforator flaps, anatomy, technique, and clinical applications that, that published with uh, Professor Blondiel and, and also Jeff. Uh, please, please, please turn your microphones off so that you don't interrupt the questions. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions for you, um, Dr. Nelligan. But again, thanks so much for that talk. It was really amazing. I think the ability to, to use these perforators the way you use them obviously has to do with uh, correct identification of the location and caliber of, of the perforators. So the first question is, you know, we saw you use a, a Doppler machine. Um, we've also had a number of talks from uh, colleagues, especially from Asia, um, Korea, and Japan, talking about the use of ultrasound and not only identifying the locations of the perforators, but also identifying the quantity of flow across these perforators. Have you had any experience with this? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? Uh I haven't had any experience uh, with using ultrasound, but I am in incredibly impressed. I've seen uh, some of the presentations that you talk about uh, at, at various meetings. In fact, there's a there's a um, there's a meeting on Sunday um, yep. uh, that's coming out of Rome on, on on the use of ultrasound, which I'm really looking forward to. But I think it's the I think it's really the new kid on the block, the new way of, of imaging things, because it gives you information not just on position, but also as you said on on, on flow, which is really useful. And yeah, I think, yeah, I've, I've signed up for that uh, online course, symposium myself, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, now, the other question, which is kind of a follow-up, is, <clears throat> you know, we've, um, at least I personally, have been uh, fooled by Dopplers sometimes, where I Doppler a perforator and I go in, um, especially with ALT sometimes, and even though there was a, a strong signal within the skin, um, the perforator actually entered the flap at a different, maybe more proximal location and potentially traveled within the flap inferiorly. Um, how often do you find that your findings intraoperatively differ from what you identified um, with the Doppler? Um, I, I would guess probably about 10% of the time. Um, and um, the uh, thermal camera that I showed you, I found to be really quite useful. Um, I, I use it. I don't think any one of these things is is the the test to do for for uh, doing perforator flaps. But I think when you add them all together, you've got you know maybe a CT angio, you've got your doctor, you've got your thermography, whatever your ultrasound, whatever. Then all of that um, makes everything um, uh, just more sure. You know you you you're you're less likely to be surprised. But I've, I've I've had the same experience as you described, where you 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 find a wonderful perforator you think and then you you open it up and you, you can't find the damn thing right yeah which is quite frustrating um we had a, along the same kind of lines um we obviously have seen papers um by colleagues around the world on the antralateral thigh flap 
um, and specifically Ron Yu's um, earlier paper on, on um, the location of perforators and the small percentage of patients who simply don't have adequate perforators for the ALT. My question for you is, does your experience mirror um, some of these findings um, or do you design your incision long enough so that you could always have a backup with potentially a TFL perforator or something more proximal? Yeah, I usually I usually design it longer just in case. Uh, and uh, and usually what I do is uh, before I commit to the flap, I'll I'll make my initial incision, uh, find my perforators, and then I'll design my flap. So I, the flap may not end up being where I thought it was going to be originally. Mm. Great. Um, we had a, a fantastic question from Hari, uh, our good friend and Coen Bator, who is on, online here with us. Uh, by the way, we have uh, we had over a hundred viewers, by the way, for your webinar. So just I think it speaks to um, the fact that people really want to hear you hear your wisdom. Uh, and Hari asked a great question in that you know a lot of times with these uh, propeller flaps, for example, these are essentially freestyle flaps in a way. You basically go to the OR and try to find a perforator that's adequate to be able to perform more of a local type option. Um, I'm curious as to your discussion with the patient uh, ahead of time regarding the options. Um, so, do you take the what Hari describes as the reconstructive supermarket approach, where you essentially have all the options available to you, and then you go in the OR and decide what to do, or um, or is it more of a focused consent for the pro propeller flap alone? No, I, I I try and get a blanket consent. I tell I tell them what flap of what I'm planning and you know I'm going to plan to do the flap from here with the, using a little perforator beside the, your wound but uh, that may not be that may not be adequate we may have to go someplace else and then I'll give them a list of other flaps for, that we might use great yeah I think that's a really good advice especially for the for our younger viewers out there I think um, we do the exact same thing our consent forms are often overly broad we just say basically you know, flap from essentially any part of the body to the affected area. So I think that's the important thing to have a backup available to you. Yeah. Well, Dr. Nelligan, thank you so much again. I, I think this was um, really uh, an, an incredible talk on on the utility of perforators, not just with free flaps, um, but also uh, with local pedicle flaps. I think a lot of us think microsurgery is all about, you know, being under the scope and reconnecting vessels. But I think it's just as much about knowing the microsurgical anatomy of different parts of the body and being able to dissect out these <clears throat> very delicate flaps and not necessarily having to divide them as you as you've shown and i think that's right. just as much it's just as much microsurgery as it is to do a you know free flap if you will sometimes even right. more difficult yeah i usually i usually tell my residents that you can teach a monkey how to do an anastomosis but you can't teach a monkey how to find a perforate and do a flap <laughs> and that's definitely true that is definitely true well, Peter, thanks again. Um, a fantastic talk. Uh, we, it's been a pleasure having you, and um, I look forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you. Have a, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.